Here we are at class number seven and chapter number six of Delivered Out of Empire, Pivotal Moments in the Book of Exodus, part one by Walter Brueggemann. As I said, we'll be going over chapter six, which is entitled, Not One Hoof Left Behind. And the verse to bring out as the pivotal moment is found in Exodus chapter 10, verse 26, which reads, Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must choose some of them for the worship of the Lord our God, and we will not know what to use to worship the Lord until we arrive there. As you've read the narrative, you'll know that the back and forth negotiations between Moses and Pharaoh continue. It's become clear that Pharaoh is no match for Yahweh. Throughout chapter 10, Pharaoh attempts to bargain with Moses. And these negotiations have to do with the scale of Israel's liberation. You get the sense that Pharaoh knows that um, he, he is bested, uh, but he is trying to um, reduce the scale of Israel's liberation. Will Moses head into the desert with just the adults? The text reads men. I think we are meant to read adults, generally speaking, which is a pretty bleak outlook, all of the parents leaving the children. But that is found in verse 10, um, chapter 10, verses 8 through 9. Or will they leave with the adults and the children? That's better, verse 24. But that still leaves the livestock in tow, which leads to today's text, the pivotal verse. Moses insisting on an all or nothing approach. He will not leave even a hoof behind in Egypt. He wants the livestock, the people, everything. And he cites a practical, practical concern as his reason, as the reason for his insistence. He says, you know, we won't know what we'll need to worship until we get there. To this, Brueggemann writes, Moses's stated reason for needing flocks and herds does not seem very persuasive to this reader. More likely, the Israelites wanted their flocks and herds not simply for sacrifice to Yahweh, but as the material means for a viable economic life outside the reach of Pharaoh. I'm reminded of the very beginning of this um, dialogue where the original purpose stated to Pharaoh for the, uh, the leaving of the uh, Israelite slaves was so that they may go into the desert to worship them. And you kind of think, well, yeah, they would certainly probably say a prayer when they got there, but off they go. Similar thing. This is all um, M Moses knows and Pharaoh knows that, that once they go, they're gone. Um, Anyway, next slide. While this consideration, that of economic viability outside of Pharaoh's denomination, is certainly important, Brueggemann makes the case that there is an e that there is even more at stake here, namely the breadth and depth of God's salvific action. That's what's at stake. Will God save a portion of Israel or all of it? Will God leave anyone or indeed any creature behind to be further dominated and subjugated by Pharaoh and Pharaoh's ways? On page 44, Brueggemann writes, what strikes me about this response is that Moses asserts he will not leave behind one hoof. This peculiar assertion claims that every animal and every part of every animal belongs to the community of slaves and will not be bargained away. Perhaps this defiance response is response concerning a hoof is to focus on the lowest part of the animal, the part closest to the ground, the part beaten and scarred by rocks in the grazing land. No matter how lowly or ignoble, all will be included in the departure. And as an aside, I had a funny moment um, when I was proofreading this where in this quote I had mistyped the last line, the part um, beaten and scarred by rocks, I accidentally typed the part um, beaten and scarred by rockets. <laughs> and, I had, and I had a good laugh. That's neither here nor there. Moving on. Brueggemann cites Nelson Mandela as a modern example of someone in the tradition of Moses who was unwilling to compromise when it came to the freedom of his people. Quoting again from page 44, when offered his freedom from prison, Mandela refused. He would not go to freedom and leave the others behind. He would not accept freedom until all his comrades in prison could go with him to freedom. So Moses, he will not go unless every particle of his community can go with him. Nothing can be conceded to Pharaoh.
Brueggemann wonders how far we should extrapolate from the story. Does Moses' insistence that all of Israel, down to the very last animal, be saved, guide us towards a universal principle? Is this story only about the salvation of the tribes of Israel, or is it about other peoples from other tribes as well? As indeed the story has been read throughout history. We've already talked about other oppressed peoples who have identified closely with the plight of Israel and the Exodus narrative. Are we to read this as having to do only with Israel or with, or, or does this point us towards a universal principle as it relates to God's saving and salvific acts in the world? Brueggemann highlights two options to the question. One, quoting from page 45, on one hand, we may extrapolate to imagine a tight, exclusory community of all of us and no one else. In other words, is God's salvation for some people and not for others? And then the second possibility. But on the other hand, he writes, there is another kind of refusal to leave behind. That is to imagine that none will be left behind. None at all. In other words, does God intend to save everyone? The answer to the question has been debated throughout the history of Christianity and Judaism. Brueggemann mentions how in Ezra we read of a holy seed and those who could imagine and insist that only those with proper genealogy and pedigree might be welcomed. This is a scriptural perspective. See Ezra chapter 9 verse 2. But against that, writes Brueggemann, the Isaiah tradition imagines that none of the community would be left behind. So you have these two different outlooks as to how far God's saving grace will go in the world. Brueggemann here cites several passages from Isaiah that single out previously excluded persons. Single, Sorry, let me read that over. Brueggemann here cites several passages from Isaiah that single out previously excluded persons that were excluded in God's salvation. So to the right, I just um, copied the page and he writes, thus in Isaiah 35, the weak, the blind, the deaf, the lame, and the mute will all be brought along home. Such disqualified persons, persons who had been disqualified by other parts of the scriptures and, and the Deuter, in the, the canonical law, might have been left behind. But here, all are invited to and expected to return and given protection for the journey. In Isaiah 40, verses 10 through 11, we get the imagery of all the weak and vulnerable, the lambs, being picked up and brought along when their own strength has failed. All are on their way home. None are left behind. Most importantly, in Isaiah 56, it is asserted that eunuchs and foreigners, the most likely to be excluded, are to be included in the restored worship in Jerusalem. The exclusion of eunuchs and foreigners from the community and from worship is based on holiness rules that deem such folk unclean and unworthy of inclusion. One can see the force of the notion of unclean that turns up in the New Testament when Peter refuses unclean food and then learns that Gentiles are not unclean because God has made them clean. Acts 10 verses 11 through 15 and also verse 34. This is the God who gathers home and who will gather all home. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. And so you the point is, you see in the scripture this ever-widening circle of who's included, and the question becomes, how far does that go? How far will it go? Is it a trajectory that we're set on to, to ever widen the circle of who's included in God's love, or are there limits to it? The scope of this vision points us to a salvation that is possibly open-ended. Who will God exclude in the end? Brueggemann wants to make the case that no one will be excluded in the end. That is the hope, at least, a reasonable hope, given the trajectory of the aforementioned biblical passages. In the Christian tradition, he writes, moreover, that notion of inclusion is voiced in response to the centurion who regard, regarded himself as unworthy. Quote, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Brueggemann mentions Rob Bell's 2011 book, Love Wins, which makes the case that scripture, scriptures allude to a God whose salvific actions in the world are broad and expansive enough for us to hold a reasonable hope that all will be redeemed and restored in the end. At least, 
This is God's desire for creation and humanity. So even if you don't think that this will eventually happen, we can agree that this is God's desire, at least. Bell thinks it's plausible that it will happen, but he at least leaves the door open to those who maybe can't conceive of such a grand scope of salvation, at least agree that this is what God wills. Bell's thesis, surely correct, writes Brueggemann, is that God's will to embrace will overwhelm every resistance and defeat every impediment that serves exclusion. In other words, God's love will eventually wear down the most stubborn and hardest of hearts. Can God pull off the full restoration of everything? Bell thinks so and encourages the reader to at least hope for it. This posture seems the opposite of those who seem to relish in the final judgment and devastation of wayward lost souls. And if you don't believe that those people exist, turn on, <laughs> turn on your television and watch, and watch some uh, programming and, and, or just talk to some people. There are many people who seem to relish this idea of their enemies um, catching what they deserve. Brueggemann believes that Moses' insistence that every animal down to the last hoof is in keeping with this desire of God for our full liberation. For Brueggemann and Bell, this is not an embrace or acceptance of cheap grace or an anything goes kind of attitude. Quoting him, it is rather an insistence that God's will for emancipation or salvation is an overriding passion that will stop at nothing to see that all can take up the well-being intended by the creator. Thus, we may imagine that some of the flock and herd feared they would be left behind, just as Pharaoh had intended. Perhaps they studied their hooves and wondered whether they would not go along on the freedom trip. But Moses intended otherwise. And so the great drama of emancipation included many hooves and all those who walked atop them. Page 47. For Brueggemann, this story points us towards a God who will not stop until all of creation, down to the last creature in Adam, is redeemed and restored. Does this mean Pharaoh and his ilk as well? What would it take for Pharaoh to be saved in the end? We may not know even it, we may not know if even such a thing is possible or how it could be done without foregoing justice. Either way, we should hope for it and trust that maybe, just maybe, God can pull it off. At the very least, this is what God must desire. So then, should we? And I'll ask that you unmute yourselves for these questions for discussion. Moses' consistent defiance of Pharaoh is an all or nothing tactic. He refuses to relinquish even one hoof to imagine a distinction or division that leaves any remnant to Pharaoh. What does this refusal to compromise the well being of any part of the community suggest about God's vision for emancipation? What risks are involved in acting on this belief, articulated and lived out by Fannie Lou Hamer, Nelson Mandela, and many others, that nobody's free until everybody's free? What might it look like for you? and your community to refuse to compromise someone else's freedom. I'm afraid there are some people, if they had their way, they would be getting rid of all the Christians. It's true. I don't think we can do that. No. Well, why did your mind go there? Well, it says that nobody's free until everybody's free. What might you look at for you and your community to refuse this compromise, someone else's freedom? I, I, well, I'm not agreeing with what he's saying because. Jesus told the five virgins that knocked on the door, go away, I do not know you. So I'm, I'm not agreeing with him. And maybe that's why I'm coming at it from a different perspective. What, mm -hmm. what makes me free may fringe on somebody else's freedom. It's just like a, if, if I had my freedom and we could go on a cruise, but we can't because of the virus, but if we could go on a cruise, we'd be going on a cruise. But John's freedom says he doesn't want to go on the cruise. So, you know, we both can't have freedom and do what we both want to do. 
And that's, I think that's, that's true with individual groups as well. That's the, where the question of justice comes in and whether or not given our own free will and our ability to resist the good mm-hmm. and um, the lovely in the world, whether or not at the end of things, there can be the restoration of all of creation. That's a, that's a good question. And one that we can't, that we, um, is, is God's love endless enough to, to, I guess, wear down the Pharaoh's hard Pharaoh's of the world and the hard hearts of the world? Or is there a point to which there is, there is no return? And there are both perspectives voiced within Christianity and both voices um, expressed in, in the scriptures. And that's the point he's making. And the point that Rob Bell wants to make is that we should at least hope for um, a restoration of all things, even if it's not possible to actualize it respecting the freedoms of all persons. And what I would want to say about those who would want to eradicate um, Christians or really just to eradicate any other group that they see as the other is that part of what they need liberated from is their limitation to see all humans as their brother and their sister as children of God. And so while you, you framed it as um, their freedom to, you know, choose to not only be a different religion than you, but to even choose to actively work against um, your life and your safety. Um, I would, uh, that's similar to the Pharaoh that we find in the story and those who exploited others for their own benefit or similar to Pharaoh's edict to kill all of the children, all of the um, males, all of the males um, born to, to the Hebrews. Um, that is not freedom. It's the whole point of the first and second chapter was that um, the freedom that Egypt promises is not freedom. And you have parables that Jesus tells about the consequences of choosing um, ways that are contrary to the life we living, living ways of God. And he used metaphors like the rubbish burning outside of the city that he called Sheol, translated as hell in our modern Bibles, is just to heighten the stakes and to tell us um, what 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 the cost of rejecting life is. Um, what Brueggemann is trying to say is that if you take certain stories like this one and you look at where they point towards, which in this story, you know, Pharaoh isn't liberated. Pharaoh Pharaoh gets swallowed up by the marsh. But what he sees is, is, is a trajectory, just as we see, you know, gods of a God of harsh judgment in some portions of the scripture. But if you take the scripture on a whole, you see a God that is opening grace to more and more peoples first to um, the, the Jews saw themselves as like the center of the whole story. And then the early Christians and Jewish Christians would find that even Gentiles are a part of the story. And then mentioned Peter would even discover that animals that were once thought of as unclean and persons that were thought of as unclean categories, Isaiah mentioning eunuchs and, and um, foreigners, um, that even those people who before was inconceivable that they would be a part of this are now included. And, and Brueggemann is wanting to have us sit with this reality that, you know, maybe the trajectory of this, the scope of God's grace is more than we have yet even imagined. And even if we come to the end and find that it is not, that there are those who are left out for their own choosing, um, it is at least appropriate, a Christian, appropriate Christian response to hope for, to pine for the salvation of all persons and to, um, instead of see those who wish us harm as our enemy, to do what Jesus modeled, which was to say, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And even if they do hurt us, that's not the worst thing that can happen to us because our hope is in more than, than what, what this world promises. That, that's my meandering answer, but that's, and, and, and it isn't to say you don't raise a good point too. And you don't, I, th- there's, there's enough diversity in, in the, in the, in, in, in Christianity to, to hold both points of view, to disagree strongly with what's offered here, but to also find hope in it. Okay. So in, I'm doing Matthew right now in BSF and we've just done the, the weeks and the uh, tares and, and the weeds and and you have to let them both grow in the ground and develop and then when they when they are uh, ready to uh, to pick you can tell them apart and the weed is stored in the barn and the weeds are thrown away 
into the fire. Well, they, they, it doesn't say fire. Okay. But not, not, at least not Matthew, it doesn't say fire. And, and then you've got the goats and the sheep. You know, they're going to be separated. The goats are going one way and the sheep are going the other way. So it, it, to me, there's separation all through the Bible. It's not that he doesn't, because the Bible also says he is waiting for everyone to come to him. But when you have these stories of the wheat and the goats and the sheep, and then you know there's, there is a, going to be some sort of separation. Yeah, the, the question comes, you know, those are, those are es eschatological parables, which talk about the transition between the realm of God in those that reject the realm of God, the transition between um, our modern, our current age, and then the age that is to come that Jesus claimed to have brought with him. And so we're somewhere in that in-between time um, where God's purposes are not actualized fully, but we see pockets of it. And, um, and so Jesus tells these parables um, using rich metaphors to heighten the stakes and explain what the cost of living contrary to God's purposes um, brings upon us. It brings upon us atom bombs. It brings upon us starvation. It brings upon us um, many degrees of degradation of life. And so somebody hearing that parable would ask themselves the question, uh, well, how does my life emulate? Is it, the, is it the, the life of somebody who cared for the least, the last, and the lost? Will I you know, invite it into the life that, that is abundant life? Or is it the life of the goats is represented by this, um, this parable, this, um, this metaphor? for what the stakes are for rejecting um, the way. And time and time again, in every age, people consistently choose one way or, or the other. And we see evidence for this all around us. The question that this chapter brings up, that Brueggemann's bringing up and that we're talking about is in the grand scope of things, um, given that uh, for God, God has enough time, enough patience and enough love to wear out possibly even the hardest of hearts, can we hope for um, the restoration, the redemption of, of even, of even the, the worst, the, 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 what is most, what is most broken um, in, in the world? And Rob Bell wants to say yes. Brueggemann seems to be wanting to say yes. I have been in the maybe category for years now, which is to say I hope for that. Um, at the same time, it's hard to envision that happening without um, doing right by justice. You know, people actually having there being some um, form of restitution for the things that people do. You know, if, um, you know, the Adolf Hitlers of the world are given a pass and welcomed in without any kind of reconciliation and justice, that, that just seems like what kind of God does that? You know, I don't know how that would play out, um, but there are stories in the Bible that point towards that. That, that, that sent us off in that direction. And that's the point of, the, of, of this chapter. And I guess what I'm saying is from those parables where Jesus you know, separates, um, they, they have more to, for me, they have far more to do with what I see playing out in real time in every age than about the, the final state of things forever and always. Um, they, I, I see their function to call disciples to a, a re repentance in the moment. And what happens to the wheat when it's cast away is God's business, you know, and but what the mm -hmm. refiner's fire does, mm -hmm. you know, is God's business. And, yeah. and I hope anyway. Keith, I just want to say you're frozen on my screen. You're not moving at all. So I don't oh, really? like that. For, yeah. Um, oh. But, and I, I don't, I don't mean to disregard Sue, your concerns. Um, I just wonder, is it okay if we kind of go off in a different, but related direction? Yes, in, I think in, so. Okay, so I'm not disregarding anything you're saying. I just want to talk a little bit more about this question, but and in a slightly you may, different way. You may be right, and you may be right, Sue. I, 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 I actually, it's for me. It's a question more than a definitive answer. Sorry, do now. So I. No, it's okay. It's okay. Just um, I was responding to the question in a slightly different way. So um, and um, so you know this this question about and I was thinking about Nelson Mandela and his refusal to leave Robben Island when he'd probably been there for so long. I, I, I don't know, I guess I missed that part of the story, you know, I knew that he refused to leave till they were all set free. Um, 
but that was remarkable to me. And uh, he had the leverage to be able to do that because the public opinion, I mean, there, there would have been consequences or he, he was a known figure at that point in time. But I think about times in history when uh, people did not have that kind of advantage. And, um, uh, you know, I think about voting rights for women, for instance. I mean, this is really going way off in another direction. So um, this is just where my thoughts were. And, you know, I think about, you know, if I'd been alive when women were lobbying for voting rights, it sounds like the kind of thing I would have done. <laughs> but, you know, white women really abandoned the women of color. And, and when the, the amendments were coming around, when uh, even the votes were coming around so many times um, for the, the Senate, which was all, uh, Congress was all men to vote on it because they, they feared they weren't going to get the vote. And they didn't hold out and say, no, we, we're not going to, we're not going to do it unless you grant voting rights to all women. They said, okay, it's fine with us. Just give it to white women. Um, so in that, I mean, this isn't exactly parallel to this situation, but you know, the, he asked the question, um, you know, can we act on nobody's free until everybody's free? Well, in that situation, white women didn't say, now we're going to, we're just going to hold out. Don't, don't give us the vote till everybody gets it. And I think about Ida B. Wells, um, you may know her, she was a, a black journalist um, who um, wrote about uh, terrible things that were done to black people in the South in the Jim Crow era, like, era, like lynchings and things that people didn't know about. Um, but she was he heavily involved in this effort and there was this huge, uh, suffragist parade in Washington, D.C. It was monumental. All these women from every state showed up wearing white and they were white horses. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, and at the end, they told the black women that they had, they had to go to the back. They couldn't march with their, their states. And Ida B. Wells said, she didn't say this, but she and her mind said, nothing doing, man. I've been in this this project as long as anybody here. And she leapt to the front of the Illinois delegation and marched right with them. She was took, didn't take no for an answer. And I just admire that kind of gumption. Um, it didn't get them the vote in the original uh, amendment, but um, you know, I just wondered if at the time I would have been able to say, hey, you know, I'm not having this unless everybody gets the vote. And so it kind of gives me a lot of like, pangs of, you know, could I have, could I have stood up to, you know, the hard hearts at the time and said, no, I won't take it. So everybody gets it. So that's what it brought up for me. So anyway, that's where my mind went, this question. So anyway, there are probably, there are things like that going on now today, even I'm kind of thinking, boy, you know, is there more I could do? Um, but for well, the limitation I, I, don't think, of I don't think we got very far out of Egypt, we metaphorically, um, <laughs> before <laughs> the idea of everyone's included, every being is included. Because I was I was wrapped up in, in reading it and they were talking about Passover. And so I Googled it and there's a second Passover, which I didn't know about. Mm. Cele a celebration of Passover. Mm -hmm. Um and it came about when the first celebration came because there were people that were excluded, unclean people who supposedly had been in, um, in the presence of a corpse, mm -hmm. a dead person or a dead being or whatever. I don't know, it didn't, it didn't say whether it included animals, but it was just a corpse. So, I mean, right then, within a year, there was exclusion within the people who were liberated. From Egypt, so I I think it I think that's a real hard thing for us because as human beings we tend to separate into groups. You can see it on a, on a preschool playground that there is separation mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I I agree. I think I think it does mean freedom for all. I think it does. I just don't know how we do it. I think we do it in little ways. I think we do it in, you know, in how we behave and how we interact with people on a daily basis. 
but individually that's about to what I can see all we can do standing up maybe for you know what we think is right and 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 going for it but I'm like you I don't know whether I would have jumped on the mat that I mean wanting something bad enough to shut it down because it wasn't all inclusive Judy I, 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 I get that I can tell you one place in my life where I'm actively not shutting it down because it's not um, all in, all inclusive. And it's, you know, as I here in the Indianapolis public school systems, we have a lottery and my children were fortunate enough to get into a really good school. They're all theoretically funded the same. They are not the same. And I am not martyring my kids' education for the sake of the cause. I mean, they are experiencing a better education than um, kids that even live very close to them, geographically mm -hmm. placed close to them, you know, live in houses nearby. Um, we have neighbors who have chosen to put down their grandparents' address in a township mm -hmm. outside of Indianapolis mm -hmm. just to get access to a better school. Exactly. Um, I, I could theoretically pull my kids out of that school and and say, until every kid has what this what they have, my kids don't get anything. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time if there was a story we could read about where somebody did something similar and brought about a, a sweeping change I would respect that um I'm still not going to do that you know because my kids and, and I my, and that's that's kind of where I was going with what I was saying because I what you're saying I saw happen in Pike Township when they opened a um a select school where you had to um have applications to get into that school and year round schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. They open year round schools. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I'm speaking of new Augusta in particular, when yeah. they opened that school, um, it was supposed to be open to anybody and everybody. But the thing is you had to have parents who understood the application process. You had to have mm -hmm. parents who had the time to do that. And so that school was way overweighted with the, uh, not necessarily wealthy, but at least the, the ones who had enough where the parents had time and maybe it had a good experience in school because some of these parents that we were dealing with had really bad experiences growing up in school. So they didn't trust anything mm -hmm. about school. They didn't trust the teachers. They didn't as, as trust administration. They probably didn't trust the application process either. So. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about this and the exodus is when God is calling out a special group of people, his beloved people, the mm -hmm. apple of his eye to go to the promised land. And it's kind of like the old covenant and the new covenant. You know, we're, I think we may be looking at two different things altogether. Am I making any sense? You know, when Jesus came, he said some other things. And when we read Exodus, we can see that it's, it wasn't only the whole group, but the Egyptians. Some of the Egyptians went with them. And the Egyptians gave them money and gold and food and clothes, whatever they wanted when they went. They said, give us, and they gave it. So... You know, it's the some of the Egyptians were included in this inclusive group, um, and when, remember when they came to Egypt, all they had was sheep. They were shepherds. That's why they went to Goshen, and now they got cattle. Hmm. Well, it wasn't really, if you think about it, an inclusive group. It was a specific group of people called out with their specific animals, and Moses insisted on the last hoof of their animals, but, you know, well, actually at this point, you would, <laughs> the Egyptian animals would be uh, pretty much wasted away by the plagues, you know? Um, but the point is that if you, if you pull out the thread of the story and you, and you, if, 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 a, if a story is pointing to you in a trajectory, if it doesn't go as far as other parts of the scripture, like that's why he brought up Isaiah is especially important where it go, does go farther, where people who were, you know, eunuchs and foreigners were, were, codified in the scriptures as outsiders do not belong are brought brought into the mountain it you see an ever-widening circle 
um, which is to say that, you know, we're getting closer and closer um, to a community, a way of living, a way of being that Jesus embodied. That was always our purpose, but we've, we've never, we've never seen the full of it or no, no, known the whole of it. And have in many ways, you know, been limited by our, 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 lim- the, our, our inability to see the possibilities um, for reconciliation and restoration in the world. And so by and large, most people that we read about in the scriptures perceive themselves to be um, a select and chosen group that um, was chosen above and against other groups, even set against other groups, given land that gave them license to drive other groups away, to kill other groups. And, um, but what, what we're noticing here is how there are moments where the circle is widened a bit. And here, I, I confessedly, I think that Brueggemann is, is getting far too much mileage out of this one sentence down to the last two. I actually think, I think, I think that he, I, I, this is not the first that's time. In, that's in an ideal world. Yeah. I, I mean, he's taking this one line and just running with it. <laughs> However, um, I, his, his overarching point, um, I don't know how far God's salvation will go in the end of things. I don't know. I don't know what's possible. God will save all that's possible. I believe that. I don't know what's possible. But I walk away from a chapter like this believing that it's appropriate to hope for a grand and all-encompassing salvation, but not one that's not one that cuts corners, that sacrif- that, 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 that that doesn't take seriously the need for justice, for people really coming to terms with what they've done, the damage that we've done, and to facing consequences for it, and um, all with re- reconciliation in mind. And, you know, there are parts of scripture that point towards a very limited, you know, a, a, a finality where there's, and then there's other parts that leave it more or less open-ended. And I think the one that, that, viewpoints that see um, a universal salvation are by far the minority within um, Christianity and, and Judaism. They are there, but they're by far the minority. Most, most believe that um, at the end, uh, there, there will be some, some things that are, that are, that are lost. Um, so maybe this is a good place to go to question two. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I actually love this question because I, I okay, yeah, I, 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 I think, I, I think this is, yeah, I think this is an invitation to question too. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Oh, oh no, 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 no. It's just four, four heads here. Okay. Four heads here. <laughs> four heads not, here. Not Talking. four heads. <laughs> Just not, not foreheads. Yeah, I heard that. Four. <laughs> okay, and question two. Why do you think human communities so often try to resume? Resist. Is, I think that's Resist. supposed to, just, that's right, supposed to be to reserve. 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 Ah, I see. I, I typed this out myself. That's proof of it right there. Um, why do so? Why do you think human communities so often try to reserve emancipation for in groups of like-minded people? Have you ever feared being left behind on the basis of some trait that a group of people have deemed lowly or ignoble, leaving your exam you examining your own hooves and wondering about your worthiness? Oh boy! Um, how do the promises cited in Isaiah and Matthew eight eleven speak to God's behavior in contrast to this kind of exclusion? Um, I, I'll say this. As somebody who has, um, who, as somebody who has um, cha- changed since my youth, and have opinions about God in the Bible that are different than the community that raised me, um, I have been just told by cousins and relatives and people who went to my church growing up that I had um, lost my way and was in, da- in danger of of hell's fire. 
So I certainly, when I say, and I'm sure the stuff, people that told you that were not right. <laughs> no, they. Oh, and so absolutely. maybe this is this is probably a lot of what a lot of this is probably just so autobiographical of how I've come come to the, where I'm at with these things. But I mean that I remember feeling that it almost makes it makes you when that happens to you. When I've been at those family functions where I felt where you know my cousins pulled me aside to tell me that my new girlfriend Kelly um, comes from an unchurched house and that um, God has told them that I should not be dating her. Right. When I come back to the next Thanksgiving, after my mom has tried to smooth things over, I feel the weight of the judgment of the feeling outside of this community that anyway, that's so my answer to that question is yes, I I have felt well, I'll that. go, I'll give I'll give you my story. So my sister and her husbands were missionary in the Ukraine. I have an a niece who is married to a minister and she was studying to be a minister when they were married. I have another niece who is a minister and is married to a minister. I have another a nephew that does children ministry. And I have another nephew who, who started out in that, but has since moved on to something else. So when the family gets together, <laughs> it's not who's going to pray. It's which one. Mm -hmm. So you can see where I am. I'm down here way at the bottom because I'm not doing any of those things. Oh, Sue. <laughs> and, and I'm the pastor who never gets asked. There's there's like oh. four other pastors in the room and like they never. Um, <laughs> oh. I'm, I, I'm sorry. That's a terrible way to feel. It is, isn't it? But you know what I found out? Hmm. It doesn't matter. God made me. I'm the way he wants me. He's working on me and I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the way I got it. You know what you wear on your stole? What does the <laughs> Lord require you but to, to walk humbly, to seek justice and what's the other one? I forget. Anyway, I came across that verse. Love mercy. At that time, I'm going to walk humbly. Going through my mind, <sighs> what am I supposed to do? Um, I can't be a missionary. I'm not smart enough to learn another language. My brain doesn't work with, well you, with words. You I can't a, do that. And, and I can't do all these other things. I'm not getting up and preaching. Well, I have preached a couple, but anyway, um, that's not my it's not my job. And, and when I came across, oh, oh, to love the Lord, that's what it is. And I said, okay, I can do this. I can walk with the Lord and I can seek justice and show mercy and, and love the Lord. That I can do. That is my job. And I don't have to worry about anybody else's job and what they're doing because I'm doing what the scripture tells me I should do. I had no idea that you, you felt that way at family gatherings. I can... I, I connect with anybody who shares those experiences. Um, and a lot of the people that I'm friends with outside of church that have either left the church, um, well, mostly that have left the church. It's, it's often those kinds of experiences that um, color their whole experience of what they think people of faith are about, Christians are about. And it's... Um, But I, I don't I don't worry about it anymore. It, it doesn't bother me anymore. Because because God's made me what I am. And and I'm reading his book and he's instructing me. He's telling me what I should be doing. And that's what I do. You saw you sell yourself short. You have a mind like a mousetrap. You remember most things. <laughs> and, and I, I, my brain is not good with words. And <laughs> And it, reading these things, most of the time when I read this stuff, when it's time for the this, I don't remember it. I mean, you've I said that it. to you've said that to me before, and I'm, yeah. I'm and I often read it out loud because if I read it out loud, it's like I'm hearing it twice. That's so fine. Yeah, my people, brain is just, you know, my brain's not good for reading. 
Yeah, so, but people learn so many different ways, and that yeah, that's a great that's a great way to reinforce it. Like I learn by writing things down. You see me like writing things down because it's yeah. it's kinesthetic. It, it, I yeah. I learn kinesthetically, so yeah. people. Well, learn I, I do I do both. Ways. I write down and I read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read out loud. Yeah. Yeah, there we <laughs> go. So. <laughs> That when not, I, when I, I, do I my, used to read to my cat, but I don't have a cat anymore, so oh. I can't read to myself. <laughs> so we're all different, yeah. and it's yeah. all legitimate. Yeah. So, when yeah. I do my uh, evening Bible study, I I always read out loud in the evening Bible study. So, mm. yeah, it's. Uh, well, I'm all, I'm often impressed by how you, you remember where things are, and basically the gist of what most things are said in the Bible. That's why you've become my person that I. If I've got a question, <laughs> I hope you don't depend on me. <laughs> oh, it's not, you're, you're, my, my brother is that way. My brother is similar. He seems to, rem I have to work really hard to retain what I read over and over again. I read things multiple times and um, with a lot of focus to like, you know, try to remember. I have to read my favorite books a couple of times through. Somebody might think that I, you know, got a really, I have a, I have a, I have a passable memory, but anyway, that. I digress. Um, I'd well, like to go well, ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this question of worthiness, I think, you know, is pretty universal. So no matter how accomplished somebody is or how rich they are or appear to be, I mean, people just don't have it together. They just might look or act like they do. And maybe on something they might not show or even understand their own feelings of unworthiness i think we all have it to some degree and some of us are just more connected to it and uh i think I, the I think worth of the people is is the, or a person is the way they react with other people mm -hmm. to me that's the worth of a person mm -hmm. this 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 sunday sermon that i just recorded and been practicing um is about the wedding at canaan and the, and the turning water into wine and um i really connected to the story on that level of being um, invited to a place with a sense that you don't belong, but discovering through the process that this was actually made for you and you belong precisely here, just part of the sermon. Um, I thought of this, yeah, the, this universal need to feel accepted mm -hmm. and worth, worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, and though, hmm. It's, it, those people that I know in my life who, who, who know what you just said, Sue, not that you feel that all the time, I don't know, but what you just said about um, knowing that you are doing what you should be doing and it doesn't ma matter as much or if at all anymore, that's amazing. Um, yeah, because we're are, not made alike. We're not all going to be able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. we, need, right. we need to do what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the wine thing, I saw a picture of, I can't believe this is right, but they said they showed this was what the vessel looked like that Jesus told him to fill. And mm. you can't see me, but you know, if you, you can imagine how big my arms, like three, four feet across, that that's how big the vessel was. And it was like, well, waist high, at least waist high. That's the, a lot the, of water. The text would take it. Two or three hours just to fill it. <laughs> the text reads twenty to thirty gallons per jug. Oh. Well, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's round it at twenty-five. That's one hundred and fifty gallons of wine when it's all said and done. So, so I see, party. Party. I see <laughs> yeah. your your ceramics in the back. Are you making anything that big? <laughs> no, 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 not even oh. close. <laughs> well, I yeah. just carried. Four As one gallon jugs of water up my stairs and thought I had a workout. <laughs> well, well, those are those are quite beautiful back there, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. We'll get talk. I don't want to sneak ahead and pre start preaching because I've, I've 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 had I've never preached this passage before. I've mm -hmm. never preached the wedding at Canaan. Um, and it's kind of kind of to look for a personal application from it. You know, you can think about Jesus and, and of course, you know, you know that the word woman is a, is a interment like deer or whatever. And, you know, once you know that, then that helps understand a little bit. But the fact that he said, I'm not ready. And then he does it anyway, that the respect that he had for his, 
his mother, which mm-hmm. you know, the Bible says, respect your aunt. There, mother. there are there are three or four different sermons you could preach from this. Um, the reason I probably avoided it was because it was so tied into the question of whether or not drinking alcohol at all was permissible. In my background, mm-hmm. that's all they seem to like. By the way, this and they would talk about different things, and that misses the point. The wine, yeah, wine was a symbol in that time for a stable community with enough resources to produce wine for leisure, and so to even have it meant that you know you you, you weren't so starved that you had to eat the grapes off the vine. You could pick them and set them aside and stomp on them, and then you could put them aside to spoil, literally ferment and spoil. Um, and, and there was, you know, this question of keeping it for longevity's sake. That's one thing, but you couldn't even get to that point if you didn't have enough resources to set someone aside to, you know, be the, the brewer of the beer or the, 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 the one who made the wine, not to mention wine skins, which animals were a valuable resource. You had to take, instead of using a, a, a skin for clothing or some other thing, you, you, ha- you, you know, sewed it into this bag to be used once. And so for Jesus to turn water into an, a more wine than you could imagine brings you back to books like the book of Isaiah and Joel, where wine was described, the place where God was leading the people was described as a place where you had wine in abundance, which is to say, this is life that is so rich, you can't even get your mind around it. So with that in mind, Jesus making more wine than you could possibly drink. I don't know how big the party was, but it could have been 150 gallons worth of wine. <laughs> I mean, bathtubs and bathtubs of wine um but it's like the best wine that they've seemed to have ever had which is to say that the life in the realm of god as we enter into this life and walk with jesus is richer than the wine pressed from the rotten grapes of our culture i just you know what i'm gonna say now so you don't need (laughs) but it's this question that's good because half the time i can't hear you up in the balcony oh no Tell Jay to turn me up. No. He he has his ways. Okay. And um, he knows what's best. And I don't. When it comes, like I said, I don't hear things. So, I mean, that's part of my problem is apparently I don't hear right. And I, because I didn't talk right when I was little. And so, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I don't worry about it. You don't talk, you didn't talk right? No, if you listen closely, sometimes every once in a while, words sneak out that's not right, especially if it's got an R in it. Josie right now is dealing with her own um, speech impediment and problems with these things. And so um, I took speech lessons through grade school. Well, that's what Josie's in the middle of doing. Mm -hmm. Sitting there with a mirror, watching her mouth, maybe. Well, um. It's three o'clock. We've been here an hour. Um, we have yes, one more, question, but um, I don't think we're going to, we're going to, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and dismiss. It's been a good discussion. Um, and uh, thank you for the yeah, time. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for thank your you. thoughts and, and for giving me things to think about. And um, Sue, I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, or will I just see John? Yep. I'm coming with John tomorrow. I'll be there. I'm Connie. Okay. Next week, will we be gone? Hey, Connie. Okay. And you can be there in spirit. (laughs) Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.